Good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, today we have the privilege and the honor to have uh, Professor Raymond Gibbs Jr. with us. Uh, Ray has been my collaborator in my first talk. I'm very glad, I'm glad uh, that I had him with me at that time at Santa Cruz, California. Uh, now he is retired, uh, but still very active in research. And uh, before he starts his presentation today, I would like to read a few words about his academic career. Raymond uh, W. Gibbs Jr. is an independent cognitive scientist, formerly distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research interests focus on embodied cognition, pragmatics, and figurative language. He is the author of many books, including The Poetics of Mind, Figurative Thought Language and Understanding in 1994, Intentions in the Experience of Meaning in 1999, Embodiment and Cognitive Science in 2006, Metaphor Wars, Conceptual Metaphor in Human Life, 2017, with Herb Colston, Interpreting Figurative Meaning in 2012, all published by Cambridge University Press. He is also editor of the Cambridge Handbook of Metaphor and Thought, 2008, uh, again published by Cambridge University Press, and formerly editor of the journal Metaphor and Symbol. So, Ray, be very welcome, and thank you very much for your patience and kindness. Great. Thank you much again for uh, your kind introduction, and it is a great pleasure to be with you today, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about allegorical thinking in language. Now, the term allegory comes from the Latin allegoria, referring to the idea of veiled language. Stories are typically thought to be literary devices that convey the semi-hidden or complex meanings to various kinds of symbolic figures, different kinds of actions, imagery, and events. And these together typically express moral, spiritual, and or political kinds of messages. And allegories are also often written as if they are extended metaphors in which the entire narrative introduces and elaborates upon a particular kind of metaphorical source domain. So, for example, the source domain of specific kinds of physical journeys is used to evoke larger symbolic life themes or messages, say, for example, how one should live their own life. There are many classic examples of allegory that people have written a great deal about, and here are a few examples of these. Aesop fables, where Aesop used animals and their actions to allegorically represent human beings and our ways of living. The Divine Comedy, where Dante describes his journey through hell, heaven, and purgatory, which represents his journey toward of his own soul toward God. The Fairy Queen, Edmund Spencer, follows the lives of several knights as mean to examine different human virtues. And this is written really as a praise for Queen Elizabeth I. And as he acknowledged, it is cloudly and wrapped in allegorical devices. So there's progress where people and concepts were used to spread the word about Protestantism. Where Bunyan's characters, ignorance, talkative, pliable, prudence, discretion, and so forth, these are used to explain specific points about the practices and faith of this particular religion. Animal Farm, a very popular one still taught in high schools here in the United States. A farm is governed by animals and these stand to represent the communist regime of Stalin in Russia before the Second World War. And this is one of my favorites. This is the Lord of the Flies. So William Golding describes the actions of a group of schoolboys who are stuck on an island how we're used to raise different kinds of questions about the rational mind, the notions of democracy, order and civility, as well as many other kinds of abstract ideals. An allegory is typically thought to arise in very specific cultural contexts and specific kinds of historical time periods. So medievalists love allegory because there was a lot of allegory back in the Middle Ages. And many of these scholars claim that Middle Ages were indeed the age of allegory. And I think it's true that the Middle Ages actually had a great deal of allegory, which is wonderful to study. But I want to make the, the following argument in this presentation today, namely that 
allegory is not just simply an art form, but emerges in different discourse contexts for meaningful patterns in everyday life, where people connect their mundane actions to larger symbolic themes. And I think that people do this almost as a kind of impulse, which we'll call the allegorical impulse. Allegory is a fundamental property of human cognition in which we continually seek diverse connections between the immediate here and now with more abstract, enduring symbolic themes. And the evocation of these symbolic themes creates rich, diverse networks of meaning that are metaphorical, they're often deeply embodied, and they give rise to multiple effective and aesthetics reactions. So I think allegory is really a, a part of how people think and how people experience their lives. And that's why we see it in so many forms of literature, for example, as well as art. But it also it appears in many different forms, which I want to give you some examples of today. So you see it in conversation, actually. And I want to present to you a part of a conversation that occurred between a psychotherapist named Judy and her client, whose name was Howard. Howard was 40 years old. He had recently been fired from his job. He was experiencing some difficulties in romantic relationships. And so he started seeing this therapist. And this is one part of a conversation they had where you see this kind of allegory emerging throughout the discourse. So the therapist, Judy, goes, when you have a problem, what do you do with it? And the client, Howard, responds, I usually let it be a problem. I don't, do, I don't usually do anything much. Does the problem go away if you don't do anything about it? No, it gets worse or it just complicates things as you go further down the road. Can you look at your own life, look down the road of that line and see what that's going to do in your life? Look down the road? Yeah, kind of visualize what your own life will be like. It will continue, it will just continue the way it is. Kind of like a snowball effect? No, no, not a snowball, just kind of floating, floating down the river. What's it like to be floating down the river? Tell me more. Well, it's comfortable, it's safe. Everything just keeps on an even keel, you know. You're just kind of floating. Kind of in a canoe going down the river or no, more like a great old big barge on a great old big river. Barge, very stable kind of. Yeah, plenty of room to spread out and sit in the sun. Yeah, you don't have to worry about falling off the edge. In sun, you know, it's kind of hazy. It's not really clear sun. It's kind of hazy, kind of half asleep. That is what it's like. Well, what happens when you come to the falls, the falls that are down there, about two miles down the river? Get the hell off the river. Well, that's certainly one way to handle it. Get out. I feel a lot of discomfort. That's what happened just last month. I hit those falls last month. Judy says, yes, last month was kind of an external situation that forced you out of a boat. And this is in reference to his losing his job. And Howard says, it was uncomfortable, but I was, I was pretty, I was enjoying it too. And I didn't want to just go back into floating. It was uncomfortable and I was out. I don't, I've been floating a long time. Hmm, well, you found what works for you in a sense. What works for me? Floating. Because um, stay comfortable and in a sense, but it may now be inappropriate. It may not be working as well as it did in the past. Yeah, I need a little excitement now and then. Some rapids? Yeah, something I can keep in control of and not drown. So in this conversation, they basically have co-created this metaphorical understanding of Howard's situation as, more generally, a life is a journey. And this, of course, is a conceptual metaphor by which we map a source to a target domain of the source being a particular kind of journey to map onto the target of how he should live his life. I want to suggest to you that it's really kind of an allegory, allegory that arises from this conceptual embodied metaphor and that we use allegorical thinking in this way as they were doing in this conversation to discover something about how he thinks about his identity. And so what they're doing is they're engaging in an allegorical kind of cognition. And they're doing this through an embodied simulation process. And this is a, an idea that has written in, arisen in cognitive science in the last decade or so, where we think about 
understanding oneself or understanding another person by imagining ourselves engaging in particular bodily actions, for example, as those depicted in the text. So when we're reading about this conversation between Howard and his therapist, we understand what the metaphorical understanding that Howard has for his life by imagining ourselves as if we too are kind of floating down the river on a great old big barge and feeling stable and hazy and hey, the sun is hazy and we're just kind of just floating down the river. We, we understand it by imagining ourselves engaged in those actions. And in a sense, that's what Howard and Judy were doing together. We're creating this imaginary scenario kind of allegory that represents what's going on in his life more generally. Embodied simulation processes have been seen to be a part of how we understand many aspects of language, including even so-called literal language. So we understand the notion of the, the expression close the drawer by imagining ourselves pushing our arms away from the body. We understand close, open the drawer by imagining our, our arms pulling something toward the body. And research that I and other people have done has shown that this also occurs even from metaphorical language. So when you understand something like grasp the concept, you imagine the concept as a metaphorical object that once you can physically get a hold of, you can bring closer to the body and examine it and come to understand it. And this is why it makes sense to talk about concepts as things that can be grasped and understood. I've also done work looking at how people understand things like our relationship is moving in a good direction. And this doesn't, doesn't just simply mean our relationship is doing well, but we imagine ourselves as moving along some path towards some kind of destination. And a good, de a good de uh, destination is in the right direction. So our understanding of this metaphor in part is through these different kinds of embodied simulation processes that help us infer the metaphorical meaning. Now, we use these simulation processes, again, in various other kinds of forms of language, and I think proverbs have an allegorical sense to them. So that these kind of compact messages about specific aspects of life in the natural world, and they stand for these broader, I dare say, allegorical messages. So in American English, we have expressions like, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. The early bird catches the worm. Don't let the cat out of the bag. Strike by the iron is hot. And again, we kind of understand these things by imagining what they are ourselves engaged in these actions. And by simply referring to these kind of physical aspects of experience, it gives rise to these larger symbolic allegorical kinds of messages. So the early bird captures the worm. You come to recognize that starting out a project at an early time and making progress on it early will help you lead to successfully completing it, such as capturing the worm. So Proverbs, which are seen in many, every culture, I think are in some sense the kind of mini allegories. And they reflect the sort of the allegorical impulse in action. Now, of course, allegory is very much a big part of many kinds of poetry. I and mean, this is the most famous one that many people have talked about. The Road Not Taken. This is Robert Frost, <laughs> and it goes like this. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that there, passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how, lead, lead, how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I should be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And as uh, Mark Turner and George Lakoff talked about this particular um, poem in their book, More Than Cool Reason, you know, it, it's understood in part through an embodied metaphor of a kind of journey. But it turns out that when you ask people, college students that I've done in one project a number of years ago, to describe their understanding of it, 
people make readily sense of the fact that it isn't just simply about a person walking through the woods. It has these larger symbolic allegorical meanings. And so here's one example of a college student who wasn't a literature student, but a psychology student. This is how they interpret one part of the poem. They say this part of the poem is dealing with the choices we have to make in life. The two roads represent different pathways in life that one may or may not choose to take. Cross is saying that as a singular entity, you may only have a singular history, which is comprised of the choices you have made. Different choices are trying to clear a new road between the two existing ones, which is a kind of indecision, which results in a new person. The last line deals with the hesitancy to make a life-changing decision. Options must be weighed very carefully. So people understand that this is just simply, again, about a walk through the woods that has these larger messages. And college students readily understand and draw these kinds of metaphorical and I say, symbolic allegorical inferences when they presented with this poem. And this is, again, another example, as was the conversation between the therapist and her client, shows how allegory enables us to explore and share the complexities of our identity, of the things that we are dealing with. And it does so by, again, putting them in concrete life, sometimes physical situations, and show how these have these broader symbolic messages. Allegory, of course, as I mentioned earlier, presents itself in a variety of different kinds of fictional discourse. And the one that I like to talk about is a, one that I've actually done an empirical work on. This is The Anthologist, written by uh, Nicholson Baker. And it's a, it's a story about a, a poet who has edited a book of American poetry, contemporary American poetry. The book is complete, but he is unable to write the introduction because he has a tremendous case of writer's block. And the book is about his writer's block, and it's incredibly funny, and it has all sorts of stories about poets, and it, it really tells the story of his life in some respects. And at the end of the book, or towards the end, he summarizes the poet. He summarizes his dilemma in the following way. I wish I could st spill forth the wisdom of 20 years of reading and writing poetry, but I am not sure I can. Now it's like I'm on some infinitely tall ladder. You know the way that old aluminum ladders have the texture, that kind of not too appealing roughness of texture, and that kind of cold gray color. I'm clinging to this telescoping ladder that leads up into the blinding blue. The world is somewhere very far below. I don't know how I got here. It's a mystery. When I look up, I see people climbing rung by rung. I see Jory Graham. I see Billy Collins. I, said, I see Ted Kuzer. These are all contemporary American poets. They're all clinging to the ladder too. And above them, I see Auden, Kunitz, way, way up there, Samuel Daniel, Sarah Teasdale, Herrick. These are very famous dead poets. They're tiny figures, clamoring, climbing. And the wind comes over and it's cold and the ladder vibrates. And I feel very exposed and high up. Off to one side, there's Helen Vendler, who was a famous professor of literary criticism at Harvard University, who's written a great deal about poetry and the lives of poets. So there's Helen Vendler in her trusty dirigible filming our ascent. And I look down and there's many people behind me. They're hurrying up to where I am. They're 23 year old energetic climbing creatures in their anoraks and goggles. And I'm trying to keep climbing, but my hands are cold and going numb. My arms are tired to tremble and it's freezing, it's lonely, and there's nobody to talk to. And what if I just let go? What if I just loosened my grip and fell to one side and just whew, let go? Would that be such a bad thing? So the baker here is, has created this allegorical, this fantasy of the poet climbing this ladder to illustrate where he is in his dilemmas in life. And I actually had some students, college students, psychology uh, students to read this extract and answer various kinds of questions about what they read. And once again, they were very able to create allegorical interpretations. So they recognized that the climbing of the ladder is a journey towards fame and that the poets that are higher up on the ladder are more famous than the ones below. I should say that I asked them, did they know who the poets were? And nobody knew any of the poets that were referred to, but they still recognized that the ones that were higher were famous. 
They recognized that the filmmaker, or Helen Vendler, was probably a critic of poetry. They recognized that the, the grasping onto the latter is the poet's insecurity at that moment about his position in life. And as also suggested by embodied simulation theory, people reported having many bodily sensations while reading. It was as if they themselves were on this ladder. So they felt fear, they felt cold in describing what it was like to read the particular passage. So readers can infer both specific allegorical references as well as sort of broader allegorical themes when reading literature. And no special literary experience is required here. I mean, one doesn't have to be an expert in literature to understand some of these allegorical messages. Although that kind of experience may surely be useful in various cases. And the ability to draw a metaphorical and allegorical inference may also depend on the exact test and that particular kind of allegorical messages. There are allegorical allegories which are much more complex. But readers, people's creations and understanding of allegory, again, involves these kind of imaginative embodied simulations, which the author Baker here placed in the text and that we can understand and appreciate through our own embodied simulation processes of reading the events depicted in the language, in the narrative. And again, allegory pushes us to explore complex issues relating to our identity and our stance for life allows us to explore who we are and what we want to be. And this is why allegory is so such a perfect way of, sort of stance for thinking about things in our life. And it's why it's such a prominent part of literature and art, as well as many aspects of everyday thinking and conversation. Religious discourse has much allegory. And this is a classic one from Psalm 23rd, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is Egypt, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so when people go to uh, Christian churches, they will often recite this particular psalm. And by reciting it, you continually re-embody what the message is by imagining again yourself walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And to simulate it every time, it gives you again come closer to having a more a kind of more closer embodied relationship with God, perhaps. Again, allegory is something that pushes us to adopt very specific instances or stances or via identities through the operations of these fundamental embodied simulation processes. Political discourse, you also see allegory in political discourse because we think about politics in allegorical ways. And this is from a, a show that occurred back in 2012 during the presidential election between uh, uh, Obama and the Republican candidate George Romney. And this is a, a show that took place on TV the night before the first televised debate that they had. They had a series of debates on TV before the election. And this commentator described what he thought was going to happen in the debate. Let me finish tonight with next week's first debate in Denver. I'll be out there to watch the two of them go at it. I have no real idea what to expect. I think Romney will take some hard shots. He may spend the whole 90 minutes blasting away at the president, serving him with one indictment after another, hoping that something will stick. I think Obama will play with him, parry the assaults, block the blows, trying to keep his head clear so he can avoid getting hurt. I think it will start slow with both men trying to be cautious, neither able to land a punch, not hard enough to register with the tens of millions watching. Then it will happen. Romney will deliver what is clearly a pre-rehearsed moment, a soundbite. It will be something about Obama not delivering on a promise, something about the economy he said he'd do but hasn't. He'll expect the president to defend himself. 
when he does, pointing to what he inherited from Bush, Romney will pounce. <laughs> He'll say that Obama's not running against Bush. This will be Ob a Romney strategy, get Obama to pass the buck on the tough economic recovery and then land his Sunday punch. So this is a common allegory to use in political context where political debates are thought of as kinds of boxing matches. And, excuse me, um, lots of cartoonists and others portray these pictorially. <clears throat> so these allegories can also appear visually. And here again, I asked uh, in a study, some students to read this and answer some questions. And they can understand exactly what the boxing match was about. They realized it wasn't a real boxing match. It was a metaphorical one. And it had these larger themes here. But they all recognized that the political debates are seen as kinds of boxing matches. But what was interesting here is they also suggest that boxing matches themselves are political debates. So when you have a boxing match, a real boxing match, it isn't just a physical context, it's a symbolic one between the identities of the two people and the cultures from which they come from. And it represents their histories and so forth, and their values. So in some sense, again, boxing matches have this own political dimension to them, which students recognized. So even in this kind of political narrative, you see allegories as being a big part of how people assert something about their identity. Again, allegories provide part of the apparatus for thinking about who we are, what our beliefs are, and what future actions we will take or actions we should take. That's exactly what they're useful for. Legal discourse is also a place we see more and more allegories emerging. And this is a particular complex example, um, but hang in with, hang there with me. And it's a case called Justice Sparling. This is the, a case called Coyle versus the state of Texas. And the justice here who wrote his opinion here, it's about a law having to do with self-incrimination. When does a person, how much can they be forced to say things that will make them incriminate themselves in a legal proceedings. And there was a discussion about whether this case was one of self-incrimination. And so as usual, they look at the, the law that had been decided before this case. And the, and the most recent case of this in Texas was one called Dixon. And the judge described the problem here of relying on Dixon because of the evolving nature of law. And he did so by using an allegory, or actually kind of more like a parable, of the woodcutter. And here it is. And this is what the judge actually wrote in his decision. I liken this area of law to the allegory of the woodcutter who attempted to cut firewood lengths. Instead of measuring each successful lo successive log to the original, he measured it to the log that was cut immediately before. At the end of the cord that he cut, he discovered the last log bore no resemblance in length to the first. So relying on the last log you cut to measure will lead you, lead you astray, in other words. And then he wrote, just as successive, each successive log was measured not against the original model log, but against the immediately preceding cut log, each successive case in the area of self-incrimination in Texas was based not on the original constitutional language, but on the immediately preceding case in this area. And that is actually, he says, a problem. So he's basically using this allegory to concretely demonstrate the underlying reason behind his decision in this case. So decisions that one makes in legal proceedings are not necessarily just based on abstract logic, but again, what he's doing, he's persuading his audience by having them engage in a kind of embodied simulation of cutting logs, so the woodcutter uh, parable. Advertising. We see allegory in a lot of ways in advertising. This is one that I happen to be interested in. This is the, the case of an American TV of what are called the cavemen. And the cavemen appeared about, I don't know, 15 years ago for a, a insurance company called Geico. And the premise of this is that if you could get online and sign up for this insurance, it was very easy. You could do it in 15 minutes or less. And it was so easy to get online and buy this insurance, they said, so easy that a caveman can do it. And then they had all these caveman characters come on and talk about what their life was like, because the caveman actually 
in the series of commercials still exist. So it was kind of funny what they made fun of themselves. So here's a couple of examples. There, were, there was a, there um, as a fake caveman census of commercial was being filmed. The guy who was the sound guy, the boom operator, turned out to be a Neanderthal a caveman who was seeing this Geico commercial being filmed and saying, oh, it's so easy that a caveman can do it. He got mad and goes, not cool. And he threw down his boom mic and walked off because the Geico commercials were insulting to cavemen. Another one, another Geico commercial, a spokesman from Geico meets these two cavemen in a restaurant and he wanted to apologize for the promotion, explaining, we had no idea you guys were still around. And then one of the cavemen tells a waiter who approaches the table and says, I'll have the roast duck with a mango salsa, which kind of shows that the cavemen here today are actually pretty sophisticated. And then the other caveman informs the waiter that I don't have much of an appetite, thank you. Because he's still so upset at the way that Geico uh, makes fun or mocks the intelligence of the caveman himself. And in a final, another commercial, there's been about 20 of these, but a final one, there are three cavemen who are at a high rise apartment party. And on the balcony, two of them discuss one caveman's decision to purchase, actually purchase Geico's insurance because of its low price. And the second caveman doesn't entirely fault him, but he states a little loyalty would be nice in their opposition to the company. So even though they work for the company, they shouldn't, they shouldn't really, uh, they should oppose it because it de depicts cavemen in this kind of negative light. So we have a lot of complex symbolic messages being offered here through these commercials. And it's a really kind of satirical allegory. So the cavemen are self-consciously irritated by the Geico commercials. And they struggle against the discrimination that they represent, because it really does kind of discriminate against cavemen. But then the oversensitive cavemen images reflect the, how the paranoid majority hide their fears by being stigmatized by the other. So in a way, it's a kind of a, a comment, it's an anti-political correctness kind of comment that the ads are making. So it's making fun of itself in sort of a satirical way. In fact, many readers or observers of this say, we like these commercials. And here's somebody who says, I'm a Native American, and I can totally identify with the Geico cavemen. The brilliance of the ad is that anyone can empathize. And media references often refer to my Native American communities in the past, or as if the Native Americans are non-existent. He thinks that the cavemen coming there and saying, we're here, we're intelligent, we're real, they create a kind of empathy, a racial empathy for this kind of group of people. And so people respond to the allegorical kinds of messages that are being floated by these very actually complex commercials. So again, allegory really works in, in this case in advertising to elicit identification as well as empathy for a particular tar target object, in this case being the caveman which leads to a positive out evaluative stance regarding both the objects, that is the caveman, as well as ourselves. So we feel good about ourselves for being allegorically empathetic to the caveman in these commercials. The allegory is just a wonderful cognitive device that we can do all of these things to negotiate who we are and we want, want to be with others. So I've given you some examples of how allegory is in these different discourses. And I wanted to give a few moments here talking about allegory as a kind of lived experience. And this is from a newspaper article uh, appearing in San Francisco a couple of years ago, where it says the retired teacher finds balance. And it described how this retired high school art teacher had this daily hobby of walking back and forth along a 14 foot tight wire that was secured in his living room, suspended several feet above the ground. So he would just walk this type wire. That was his kind of hobby. He did this every day for a period of time. And he described why he liked doing so, because he says, it's all about balance. Basically, we are all walking a type wire. And when you're on the wire, you have to be focused. So many things affect your balance. If you're tired, depressed, impetuous, unfocused, irritable, hungry, it shows up immediately on the wire. So what he's doing is he's, again, negotiating his own life, coming to terms with his own life of thinking of it as a kind of walking on a type wire, which many of us do or think about, 
And he actually does it. He embodies it as a way of helping him better understand the allegorical way of thinking about his life. We also, I think, in many cases, we actually seek out experiences in nature, in the world, so that we can discover allegory. So, for example, in, in Spain, we can walk the El Camino de Santiago, which is this hundreds of mile long journey that takes people a month or two to walk. And it's a kind of relig religious pilgrimage. And people really do this, not just for the physical energy or endurance it shows, but for the spiritual values it gives them. And so um, they, by doing so, they learn, for example, how to deal with the burdens of life that they carry with them and how to release some of those burdens so they can be freer in life and more appreciate the, the, the wider world around them. So it's really not just simply a, a, a walk. It's a pilgrimage, spiritual, psychological thing that we try to discover through this embodied kind of experience of action. And here's one that I often give sometimes in talking about allegory in my own life. This is a race truck driving experience. Uh, many years ago, when I graduated from high school, I got a job working as a truck driver for a company in Boston, Massachusetts. And they put me on this truck, and I didn't have the right license. I'd never driven a truck that way, that big. And I was too young to drive a truck that big, but they didn't care. And so the first day that I was there, they got me in this truck, and they gave me a map, and I had to go make all these deliveries. It was a really big truck. And I went to downtown Boston, and immediately – I was on a one-way street and there's cars on both sides and I was stuck because I thought the truck was too big to get down this street. And I've had this job for maybe 12 minutes now and I think I'm going to get fired because the truck is stuck. I just couldn't move down the street and there are cars behind me and it was a big mess. But then all of a sudden I came to the realization of how to deal with this situation, which was don't look to the sides, just step hard on the gas and go straight ahead. And that's what I did. I looked straight ahead and I stepped on the gas and I got out of the street and I turned the corner. I was going down another street and I went, whoa, that works perfectly. And so it, it immediately talked to me like, this is how I want to live the rest of my life. Don't look to the sides, step hard on the gas and go straight ahead. And to stay focused on the things that I want to, to do and not get worried by things bother me on the side. And so life as a journey is a big metaphor, but understanding very specific bodily experiences like being stuck in a car or truck driving down a street is also representative of life. And you can learn from those occasions and generalize its life overall. So here's again, a case where bodily experience helps create the specific allegories we live and live by. So my conclusions today are the following. I want to suggest to you that allegory is something we often live. It's something we experience in very mundane ways throughout our life. And allegory is not just simply a type of linguistic meaning, and it's not simply just a, a particular literary mode of communication. Allegory is an imaginative projection of ourselves into the minds and worlds of others. This projection is very much tied to our fundamental embodied simulation kinds of processes. Allegory is a psychological impulse, and therefore it's an ordinary part of everyday minds and actions. An allegory most typically arises in the context of people's life struggles, as well in the quest to find meaning in what we do in our lives. And that's where all of these great allegorical literatures and works of art and ads and so forth come from. When we we face these struggles. And allegory offers greatest substance to abstract concepts about what our life is like. It gives us guidance about how to think about specific ideas, about who we are and what we hope to be. And being open to diverse interpretations given various discourse genres and situations, allegory points us to ambiguity. It points us to think more about the meaning of what we are doing. And that's why I love it. And I think most generally, allegory is the freedom of the imagination. This is why it's such an important concept tied to the study of metaphor. Allegory is the freedom of the imagination. And for this reason, I, I always want to suggest by closing, please enjoy your life. 
but live it with all the pleasures of allegories that you live. Thank you very much all for your attention. Cheers. Thank you very much, Ray. Great. It was indeed a very interesting talk. And I'm sure there will be comments and questions in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very uh, much. It's my pleasure. Hello? 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 <laughs> Hello? <laughs> oh, I guess you can't hear Anna Cristina anymore. Can you hear me, Ray? Yes, we hear you. Okay. That's because her microphone appears to be off. Oh, okay. Sorry, the microphone is off. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying is, uh, we don't have a picture of yours on the screen. We only have stripes. We have different colored oh. stripes. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, I look better that way. But <laughs> not really. But anyway, no. we can hear you. That's the most important. Okay. We can hear you. Uh, Ray, uh, we have now the, the question and answer uh, period. Uh, and we normally do as a list. So whoever wants to, to ask, question or make the first comment is welcome to do so right now. Can I ask a question? Ah, sure, Marcella. You're welcome. Hi, how are you? hey. Hi everyone. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It was very inspiring. And I think it reflects very much what I've been working on. And uh, it's wonderful to know that metaphor has somehow had a kind of uh, con a conceptual upgrade. <laughs> yes. So it's not just about words, but it's about uh, narrative. And yes. I find it absolutely fascinating. It's as though that before we used to work with words and uh, expressions and leave the allegories to uh, literary critics or liter uh, literary scholars. So I'm so glad now that uh, I think the interest uh, in, in those areas uh, is now part of the debate on metaphor. So thank you very much for, you know, exploring this issue. And uh, uh, so do you see, my question is, uh, I've been somehow trying to categorize different types of allegory because it it, it helps uh, to analyze them. So I mean, of course, the, uh, the obvious cases of uh, parables, you know, the particularly the religious ones, and uh, but there are different types, and um, so some uh, are somehow project real narrative, I mean real narratives, but narrative mm -hmm. with a format of narratives, yeah? Mm -hmm. What happened in a particular form like uh, the religious ones. Mm -hmm. But others are, uh, we have in our minds to create the narratives, uh, particularly if they are political, uh, moral, we have to somehow uh, infer uh, the, the message, the meaning, the idea, which is in fact being uh, mm. projected. So, mm. but do you see uh, any difference in those allegories or the, the mechanisms are pretty much the same? That's a great question. And in fact, I think some traditional allegory scholars would suggest that perhaps some of the things that I was referring to are not really allegories, but they might be parables or fables. And there's a bunch of rhetorical terms that people sort of chop up these kinds of narratives, so to speak, into these different kinds of categories. And I think that's fine to do as a, as a 
as a kind of work in linguistics or rhetoric, but as, as what you just said at the end, I'm not sure that they necessarily reflect different kinds of thinking per se. The same underlying simulation imaginative process may be, uh, you know, underlie all of them in terms of the effects that they create. So um, from my point of view as a psychologist, I try to see what is the, the driving force behind these different things, but not necessarily just because we can I create or discover different categories that they necessarily all work in very d discrete different ways. I, they, I think they all have something common to all of those. So, but you know, there's, there are different, I think you're right that there are some allegories that refer to, you know, ongoing, existing, real, concrete, everyday life. Some of them refer to these kind of fantastical, imaginative things. So, that, that it, you know, and some of those are going to be hard to understand than others, perhaps. There's some poems that I've done work on that are uh, right, quite complex and have a, a bunch of different allegories within them. So I think complexity is important, but I don't, again, think necessarily that uh, we c come to these and understand them in discreetly different ways. There's some very common things of metaphorical thinking and embodied simulations that are fundamental part of all of those. I think we agree. Okay, I agree. Now, can I ask one more question, the last one? Can I, Anna? I cannot sure. No, oh, you can. Yeah. About the embodiment aspect of uh, allegories. Uh, because uh, you, you gave an example that uh, you have the, uh, you yourself presented in your book. Which you opened it with a metaphor about uh, boxing matches. No, political mm -hmm. debates about boxing matches. Mm -hmm. And you gave the alternative, which is very interesting. Boxing matches are political debates. If you want to make a statement, if you want to make a, an issue, which is much harder to project what is actually at stake here. Yes. Uh, so perhaps you have to elaborate, whereas with the boxing matches, uh, with the political debates of boxing matches, this is, it, it's conventionalized. Yes. Okay, but my question is, when you have an abstract, uh, an abstract source domain, mm -hmm. being, uh, like political debates, mm -hmm. uh, projected upon a concrete one like boxing matches, mm -hmm. I think the embodied, uh, the embodied nature of the source domain is so clear in metaphor it disappears here somehow. So my question is, how does uh, embodiment fit into a broader view of allegory? So let me answer your question in the following way. And this goes actually to that particular data. When participants start saying that, well, you know, boxing matches themselves are political, it was one of the things that has led me to think about how many of the typical source domains, like in conceptual metaphors, we think metaphors arise from the mapping of these concrete, often bodily source domains into these larger abstract topics. But in fact, the source domains themselves are metaphorical. They're allegorical. So bodily experiences like boxing matches, bodily experiences of taking journeys, walking through the woods, which is just a simple thing, that itself has metaphorical, symbolic, allegorical meaning, it can. Driving a truck down a crowded street in Boston can give rise to that as well. So I'm actually using this to kind of suggest that a lot of the things that we think about bodily experiences are themselves inherently metaphorical. That kind of changes how we think about what metaphor is. So metaphor, the body isn't just this natural thing which has no symbolic mess meaning to it. Bodies themselves are allegorical and metaphorical. So I, I'm thinking of metaphor in, in somewhat different ways than I used to because of these, these ideas. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, we have time for more questions. Could I jump in at this point? Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so once again, Ray, fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, and it'll be interesting once you get to look at the recording of it, because when you're, you're, your video now is, is frozen, but it's normal. But 
or minutes there, as, as was said, it was a sort of a pixelated, stripe, fluttering, beautiful work of art, <laughs> which is coming from the work of art behind you, randomly yeah. and accidentally in a weird way, yeah. but your intention, because I know you painted that work of art behind you, yes. made its way into that random sort of pixelation, pixelation that took place. Yes. So this is leading someplace. What I really liked about your talk was that it ran the gambit all the way from what most allegory seems to be like, which is heavily designed and planned and thought out and creative and clever, um, evidenced by the, the caveman ads that you um, so well described. But it can also range all the way back to appreciating things that were you know, completely randomly present, not designed at all. Looking yes. at a beautiful cloudscape and seeing yes. this is how I feel about X. Yes. Um, it seems most of it's the designed part, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be yes. random, completely random. Yes. So my question is, is there a third category, perhaps, of something like designed randomness? And I think this fits very nicely what occurred in the previous room when we all got Zoom bombed. Yeah. I don't know specifically the te technology or technique behind making that happen. Is it purely a bot? just grabbing bits of video and audio and jamming, jamming them together in some chaotic fashion, or if there has to be a live hacker working at the moment, or a mixture right. of the two. Um, but that's kind of a, a weird, maybe different way of thinking of it, where somebody designs something to be dynamic and random and chaotic right. even as an allegory for things like the way we have to communicate right now through this crazy um, uh, video platform. Right. So, Right. Thoughts about that, please. Well, I mean, the issue of, you know, I, I agree that a lot of allegories are, top, are typically thought to be highly designed by creative artists who are very brilliant writers or artists or whatever. Um, and that's, you know, I don't want to, you know, denigrate any of that. But I, the fact that we are all typically able to understand those allegories, um, even though we don't have that kind of necessarily training to do so, suggests that there's something within all of us that is capable of doing so of thinking in these kind of allegorical ways. And the fact that we can find accidents out there in the world and just sort of randomly sometimes discern metaphorical relationships that even may have larger symbolic values such as allegory or meanings such as allegory suggests that again, that you know, the, the mind is fundamentally allegorical in, in, in significant ways and that we, 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 are in some cases at different times open to the allegorical possibilities touching us. And so, um, you know, so I, I think that the still fundamental to all of that is the fact that we all have this kind of inherent metaphorical thinking ability, which also has symbolic values that gives rise to allegory. That's just who we are as human beings. And you see evidence for this in every language and every culture. And I, I, I'm trying to kind of demystify some of that and say that this is not a, a, a unique thing that only certain people have, that everybody has the capacity to do this. I mean, another one's like um, fairy tales. As uh, I mean, Mark Turner has written about all sorts of these things, but, you know, fairy tales that kids can read and get some meaning out of. They're very allegorical. So even children have the ability to think in allegorical ways at certain times. So I think the part of the motivation for the work is trying to kind of devalue allegory away from its high peak and something that's only seen in the Middle Ages to something that we all do all the time in our lives. Thank you. Yep. There's still time. So if you would like, you can ask your questions. Else would like to make a comment or a question? Can I, Anna, can I ask? Can I raise ask a question? I would be interested if somebody in Brazil can. I mean, I've read various Brazilian literature. I would be interested if someone could send me email describing some book, some set of poetry that really shows allegory in a beautiful way within Brazilian literature. Yeah. I guess this can be this can be done. Yeah. yeah. You would have you would have to leave your your email address. And yeah, I'll chat. send it out. To, I'll send it out, and you can all, if somebody has something, you can send it to fine, me. Fine, fine. Yes, you will. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, 
Does anybody else have, has a comment or a question for us, Ray? Hello, can you hear me? Sure. Hi, Ray. It's Julie Lamb. Hi, Hi. Hi, Julia. Wow, that was awesome. I like the way that you broke open the physical source domain and made it so lively and active and like, you know, human on a day to day level. That's awesome. It, it inspires me because I'm still working backwards from theory to kind of get there. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, I've been working still on trying to propose the locations of City of Gold mm -hmm. and working backwards on all of these kind of really enduring, I guess, stories that keep getting retold, well, kept getting retold, but I don't think a lot of scholars are doing that anymore. So it feels like I'm kind of out on the outlier still writing about um, fantastic caravans, the Excalibur. Mm -hmm. the city of gold um all these kind of things like well so i'm down here still studying the ruins near the river valleys of masalia the old messiah but i was wondering i guess one of the categories i was still waiting for you to cover would be the the information that's still decoded in art mm -hmm. do you think that we can still find the same thing in art and of course. And then how, how do we see that there? Because we really ha seem to have to be experts to understand. And it does take us again into that, where you say that the literature, it seemed like it was uh, very specific for for the literate, actually. Yes. yes. Um, of course, allegory and art are intimately related. And I participated in uh, various symposium, and uh, I, there's a couple of books that are coming, edited books on allegory coming out where these fantastic art critics and historians go into great detail about the allegorical means that's seen in various kinds of, say, for example, classical Greek sculptures and, and vases that are made and Italian works of art. And they can explain it beautifully in a historical context, but a lot of the things that they're suggesting, I think, are still motivated by basic kinds of embodied metaphorical thinking. And so this is what I, I, how I make connection between the things that I'm interested in as a cognitive scientist with what they're interested in, for example, as art historians. And I can make sense of what they're doing partly because I understand some of these embodied metaphorical foundations for the work they're doing. But art is actually a fabulous way to kind of uh, show the allegorical mind in action, both in terms of how it's created, as well as in terms of how people find you know, appreciation for the meaning and the symbolism behind what is produced. So yes, art is, is a big place for, for, for allegory. Yeah, that's, that's a great place for data and evidence I've been using. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, thank you. Very good. Um, Ray, as you know, I'm very much interested in embodiment. Yes. I even, uh, we even translated that book of yours uh, on uh, embodiment in cognitive science. Mm -hmm. uh, when I teach my uh, topics uh, on cognitive linguistics, I like to bring up the example uh, of Jesus' Jesus's words when he says that every man that looks to a woman uh, and to the point that having um, about his feelings for her, of having passion for her, has already committed adultery in his heart mm -hmm. with her. Mm -hmm. And I say, you see, uh, I say to my students, you see, uh, yes. these are words of over 2,000 years ago, and yes. it's in line with neuroscience. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. Right? When, when you're talking about, uh, you know, how embodiment is present in people's interpretations of mm -hmm. allegory, uh, and how it is easy for them to, you know, kind of uh, project themselves into the messages that they are interpreting. I was thinking of, of this, and I couldn't help thinking about the so-called um, um, mirror, mirror neurons. Uh, yes. Yeah? So yes. they play a part in this, so that when we listen to something or when we read something, we also feel together with uh, those words that we are we are reading, it's yes. kind of you know projecting uh, this embodiment in our bodies, right? Yes, yes. So uh -huh. I think 
mean, I mean, just, I mean, this is why we can understand, you know, things written thousands of years ago because of the fact that we have some shared experiences of our body across cultures and time, and that able to under, get appreciate meaning from things that are done a long time ago. But the sure. other thing, which was part of your example and, and part of what I was trying to convey today is that allegory doesn't necessarily have to be some large narrative where one metaphor is extended and elaborated upon across the narrative, but rather just simply even seeing a small segment of language can be evocative of a larger allegorical scenario of how just looking in someone's eyes, that small little hunk of embodied experience can be generative of a large set of symbolic knowledge and greater understandings, which I think are part of the allegory. So allegorical thinking comes in small bits throughout our lives. And I think a lot of people don't want to uh, ascribe allegory to such small little embodied things, but I, I, I would like to do so because I think there's still very much a part of how we walk around in the world and find meaning in what we do in very small ways. And we're not even aware of us doing that, but I think that's a fundamental part of how we live our lives. So small little bits of language, small little bits of advertising or little things that we do is, is evocative of these larger uh, allegorical themes. Definitely, yes, right. And I enjoyed your, I enjoyed your way of thinking when you got stuck, you know, with the truck. Yeah. And you said, you know, just look ahead and yes. and, and push down yes. the yes. the gas. And, and I, I should, and I should say, as a, as a metaphor, you know, I, I I'm not like a that that total crazy person who does that. I am a soft-hearted person in lots of ways, but. You know, it's just general. Don't be distracted. Keep keep going, and right. you know, rather than stopping and worrying about everything that's happening around you, just keep going. It, it, I just I came very consciously to that that conclusion right there in the truck, like ten seconds after the bus was over, and that's stuck with me since then. Very good. Yes, that was great. Yes, uh, we have a comment here uh, by Mark Turner. It says, "Hi Ray, thanks for a great talk." Brazil indeed has a fabulous tradition of allegorical short stories in the 20th century. That's his comment. Great. Great. I'll find those. Yes, thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, well, there is still time. Can I, can I thank everybody? Thank you all for being here. And I appreciate your coming here. And seeing all your faces and so forth. It's been great. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a great honor yeah. to be here today. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Are yep. we, thank are we you. done? Thanks for the talk. <laughs> yep. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Ray. All right. I have some line up for questions. Oh, OK. Hi, Ray. First one. All right. OK. All right. Good. I'm here. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I do want to say. You are a kind-hearted and soft person, and I appreciate that. And the, my question it has to do with the relationship between allegories and that type of um, spontaneous, ubiquitous emotion that you can get from have, finding allegorical meaning in the day-to-day. -day. So what do you think the relationship is between um, the emotional response you get from experiencing allegorical moments, not just from language or art, but just from your everyday existence? And how do you think that relates back to our different cognitive processes, such as maybe decision making or just, um, you know, how we how we move through our lives. Just kind of want to hear about the relationship between the allegory, the emotion and and um, and everything else. Well, I mean, you can you can do a little therapy with me here because I, <laughs> is, I am constantly amazed at the allegories that pop up in my little silly mundane life. And I see these little things going on, and, oh, this means this, and that refers to that. And I wonder if I overinterpret the world too much. Like, I'm a metaphor scholar, so this is my, this is what I do. And, but I think that I'm not the only one, and I get an emotional pleasure out of finding these things. So to me, it's a pleasure, partly as a scholar, but it feels good to me as a human being to find these other patterns of meaning. And so I think, you know, part of the reason why metaphor is so great in general is that it, it it is very important in terms of our establishing what is meaningful for us in life in big and small ways. And so I find this incredibly emotionally satisfying and it, it helps me keep my emotional self insane. I, I don't know about the rest of you in this way. 
I don't know about how non-metaphor scholars live their lives in that way, if they do at all, but I, I find it incredibly pleasurable. That, that would be my response. Yeah, I find it super interesting in terms of the relationship between um, like allegory, this pleasure response that you're talking about, and also the, you know, your work on irony and humor, thinking yes. about thinking about how um, it's a negotiation of two different states. And maybe, uh, I guess, I'm seeing a relationship between this emotional response to allegory and how you transition from like processing things as one perspective into the other and trying to right. make meaning, make sense of all of these other different aspects and uh, bring yes. it together into your own understanding of the world. So yes. um, I thought this was a beautiful talk, Ray. Thank you so much thank for you. giving it. It's really thank lovely to much. see your face. So. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mai Chi, would you have a question? Mai Chi? I think she, she, she has nope. her camera on. No. <laughs> all right. It's all right. You had your camera on. So I understood that as, you know, Sorry. a request for a question. All right. Uh, well, let me see if there is anybody else here on the list. Um, anyway, one or, one or two more questions, and then we will um, finish our presentation for today. If anybody wants to have a go, it's, it's time now. Yes, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, I suppose uh, there are no more questions. And yes. I have to say thank you again, Ray. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank Hope to see you again you. soon in the flesh. Before, before we, we go, um, I would like to remind you that our final talk uh, will be on Tuesday. Exceptionally, it will be on the 22nd. Um, that is because otherwise it would be on the 24th and it's it's a holiday season yes. so we, we we prefer to anticipate it for the 22nd and for the last talk we have uh, professor eliana melu she is going to talk about new technologies uh, methodology and uh, cognitive linguistics so that sounds uh, as an exciting and, and very uh, promising thing so Ray, thank you very much. Thank Wonderful. you much, everybody. Thank us. you. Okay, it was a pleasure to see you. Bye, Santa. Thank you very much. Okay. Just... See you. Thank yeah, I'll you. see you in Santa Cruz. Come to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I will. Yes. Yeah. Let's wait. Again, again. And then I will. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Solange. Só mais uma e nós terminamos, Solange.